the series of um, seminars to a climax around all the things that we've learned. Over, obviously, over the last few Bible education seminars, we've covered a number of different subjects, but they all relate to the fact that there is biblical evidence and prophecies which clearly demonstrate that even in these uncertain and distressing and fearful times in which we live, God is in total and complete control of all things. So tonight, I just want um, briefly just to, to cover just some of the things that we have already done over the course of our uh, seminars, as, um, as Derek has alluded to. And we started by looking at COVID-19, look, looking at the current pandemic that has brought the planet to a standstill. We've looked and saw that although the world seems to be in chaos and turmoils with wars and pestilences and famines and all those, all those things, COVID-19 only being one of those, that God is actually in complete control and always has been throughout the last 6,000 years of the history of the world. And we look very clearly in Daniel chapter 2 at the, a few prophecies that highlight that God, you know, the control that God has in world affairs and with world empires. And we saw in his prophecy revealed to Daniel in Daniel chapter 2 that he was back then and still is in complete control of all of the empires and the dynasties as if they one by one have fallen and taken over by another but that first Babylon, then the Medes, then the Persians, then the Greeks, and then the Roman Empire, all the way down to our day, that whilst we're living in the period of the toes and prior to the arrival of the stone power, which reflects the return of the Lord Jesus Christ coming back to smash the image in, in, in to, to bits and to establish the kingdom of God on the earth, that God has been and always has been in control of all of those affairs, knowing exactly what was going to happen and how it was all going to unfold. And then we had a good, quick look at the Jews. Um, we looked at how God has been complete control of the outcomes of the Jewish people, all revealed by in Bible prophecy because of one promise he made to one man at one time. This is to the man Abraham. And the promise was that his seed would be a, a multitude and that God would be their God, irrespective of what would transpire or how things would unfold. And even though for centuries it appeared on the surface that God had abandoned his people, he has always been in control of their destiny to teach them to trust him. And we saw the Bible speak of prophecies which, which all have been fulfilled, which point forward to the Jewish people having a homeland, which was achieved. We finally brought them back into their own land as we see them now, and even then, against all odds, have survived and continued to thrive in their own homeland, all well, because God is in control of their destiny and God's purpose hasn't finished with them yet. And he still holds a special role for them in the kingdom, which is shortly to be established. And then we spent a couple of nights on Armageddon and we looked at the prophecies concerning um, the time in the near future called Armageddon. And we, we took two nights to explore exactly what would happen and unfold, I suppose, and unpack the time when Daniel 2 talks about the image being smashed in, in the feet by a stone power that would come. And we saw that Armageddon will be a time where God will bring the entire world to a battle between an alignment of the confederacies of kingdoms in the north and to an alignment of confederacy of nations in the south. And there'll be a world war with territorial intent and fought just outside the city of Jerusalem where God will ultimately intervene through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and destroy all the nations that are gathered there. And in their place, he will establish a kingdom with his son as the king to rule over all the earth. And so we've seen through all of these prophecies spoken by prophets often some 2,000 to 2,500 years ago, which have stood the test of time, that they have provided evidence and proof that God is in complete control over the world and that he does have a purpose with this earth. And all of these prophecies have brought us to the time we live in today. And to consider what is about to happen in the very near future. All of these prophecies have talked about the years which will cover a thousand years of history shortly to be unfolded with a new king who will be established over all the world to take control of all nations and to rule. The king which we all know because it's been discussed every time throughout each of these seminars is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know I suppose I'm not sure about you, but um, sometimes it's quite hard to imagine what the kingdom will be like. But tonight, what we want to do is to help you understand a little more about how the Bible speaks about how the kingdom is going to come. 
and to perhaps share a little bit more about what the Bible tells us we need to do in order to prepare. So as we go through tonight, we want to ask a couple of questions. I want to just pose a few questions at the very beginning and then and answer these as we go. You know, Earth's future king is a question, isn't it? What will this king and what will his kingdom be like? And so there's a few questions we might want to ask as we as we go through the challenges of, of, of what we are going to look at this evening. What, what is wrong with the world as we as we see it now? And why does it have to change? You know, what, what is the purpose of the kingdom and, and why is it necessary? Um, how will it be different from today? And how is it actually going to work both politically and socially? And then, and then if, if it is going to change, then why should I want to be part of the new system? And, and what part would I play in this future arrangement? And as such, after you understand that, I suppose the last question, which really is the subject matter of tonight, is what should I do to prepare for my part in the kingdom? So I sort of want to start firstly with this question, you know, what is wrong with the world now and, and why does it need to change? What, what is the purpose of the kingdom and, and why, why is it even necessary? Well, firstly, I want everyone to consider the current forms of government that we have in the world, the current forms of governance that have been applied throughout the ages. And on the screen are only just a few. We don't need to have a think about all the different forms of governance that the world has tried to put in place. And note the fact that they've often experimented with these over the years in an attempt to make decisions, to, to not only try and manage the health of their population, but to manage the wealth of their population, to, to grow their own empires, to provide for their poor. You know, when you consider the world governance structures that have been in place, there have been numerous and many. Some tried multiple forms in the same time of their governance, all to various degrees of success. You know, when we think about the different forms of government, where we just the sort of the key ones that we might bring to light, we think democracy, the, the rule of the people, a representative government generally elected by the people for the people, where the principle is that the majority rules. You know, that's been primarily a Western development, isn't it, of late, um, and has some merit, but has many failings. You know, when we look across the world, we've seen dictators, where we've seen a ruler with total control over a country, and typically a, a dictator is one who's obtained the authority and the control, usually by force, um, either through taking power deliberately and indirect, uh, deliberately because of things that aren't right or because they felt things should be done better. And we've got various republics. Um, the republic is, a, is, is, a different, is an interesting form of government. It's, um, it's a form of government in which the country is considered a public matter. You know, it's not, it's, it's not a private thing. It's, it's something that's out in the open. And it's the, the primary positions of the public, uh, uh, sorry, the primary positions of power within the republic are attained usually through democracy or an oligarchy, or, or where the power and the authority rests within a few wealthy and nobility individuals, or it's a combination of a mix of those things. You know, and, and often people have established a republic in the opposing side to where there had been a monarchy. Um, and so in a republic, there is no monarch as a head of state, but it's, it's, a, it's a public thing. So it sort of sits in the middle between democracy and, and a monarchy. What about the um, what about aristocracy? Well, the uh, um, sorry, aristic, arist, sorry, I've got slipdexia. <laughs> um, an, an, an aristocracy is a form of government where the wealthy nobles rule, um, and they rule a country. So they there are a small group of a few that are often usually wealthy, and they have control over the poor, and so they control you know, everything where it, where it goes. And, and that often has been applied and, um, and been used. It, um, probably the most obvious form of that just before the French Revolution. Um, but again, limited success and full of flaws. And, and 
many, many times there have been a monarchy, a form of government where the monarch or the king sits at the head of, of a state. Some of which have been good, some of which have been terrible. And, and at times there's been anarchy where there's a complete lack of government and a complete lack of rulership. You know, and, and when we consider all of those different forms of governance and government, there have been many, 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 many more than what's just on the screen. In fact, um, there's been well over 20 different forms of government applied, and, and probably when you add all the combinations and the variations of the theme of those 20, there are multitudes of different governments. So what's my point? What's the point of this? Well, I think the point I'm trying to make is this, that man has attempted to manage governance in many, many different ways. But each system hasn't been perfect. In fact, fundamentally flawed and often disastrous. No king or queen or despot or ruler or president or dictator has been successful in dealing with the issues of their nation, instead use, um, usually causing more challenges, more problems, more concerns, often only to be overthrown or murdered or their government dissolved. You know, many, many governments have attempted to, what, what many of the things that governments have attempted to do around peace and harmony and wealth and equitable distribution and their health and well-being have actually ended up destroying the people they serve, increasing the wealth of the rich, abusing the power and authority that they have, all in the quest for power or greater rulership or advancement of their own personal wealth. And so the question we have to ask is, is why? What, why, is, why is it not working? See, usually the reason for their lack of success, no matter how well intended they may have been when they began or when they started out, they've failed. Many have failed due to pride and arrogance and greed and power and authority and the combination often of all of those things. And what we've been left with when we review the globe is systems of governance all over the world that are splintered and problematic and flawed. You see, at the heart of the issue, no one, even in their own kingdom, rules very well or in their own um, country has got control of all things. No one has that control really carefully managed in their own territory, let alone over the world. No one has universal control or authority over the world. You see, nations may have clear systems of government to govern within their own borders, but all to varying degrees of success. However, the world's a big place. And with the rise of globalization and large global conglomerates and commercial entities, which now span many different countries, the world struggled to manage the power that a lot of these corporate giants now wield. You see, with tax evasion, the exploitation of labor, social injustice, inequitable working conditions and pollution, just to name a few, are challenges arising from the rise of these global giants. You know, consider the large global corporates that are around the world today, the big pharmaceutical country, uh, companies, the big global mining companies, the big um, uh, oil companies, the big tech giants. You know, these are all global companies who only answer to their shareholders rather than their respective governments in the jurisdictions they operate in. They've often avoided tax. They make ludicrous revenues all whilst exploring country labour laws and thumbing their noses at tax legislations and using tax havens in other places and often destroying the countries that they're operating in with rubbish and pollution and waste, all in their quest for profiteering and shareholder returns. And even though they at times might try to do the right thing, ultimately they're driven by profit. You see... Globalization is only one of the challenges that the world faces. You know, it's the issues of globalization and corporate lawmaking that many global bodies have tried to grapple with, the United Nations being one of them. You know, and they list globalization amongst other factors to fight against what they refer to as global catastrophic risks. You know, they list globalization as one of those factors, but not one of the key ones. You see, they refer to the things that they're trying to deal with as key global 
catastrophic risks. These are key, key global risks that they're anxiously pondering and trying to find answers to because they pose huge risks that affect the planet and could, if left unchecked, cause untold damage and chaos. You know, on the screen are a number of those things that they have as part of what they refer to as their global catastrophic risks. These are just a few of them. You know, the issue of climate change and the issues associated with global warming and sea level rise, the impacting of habitats in low-lying countries, all of which house most of the world's current population. That's a bit of a challenge for the world. What about AI or the, or the risk that's posed by artificial intelligence? And the big challenge with that is the loss of individual privacy through digital piracy. You know, as technologies converge, creating large data mining opportunities, large corporates are exploiting this opportunity for profiteering and personal gain. And they are deeply worried about the impacts of AI across the globe. And that's not to mention biotechnical risks or biotechnolog biotechnological risks, the risk of genetically engineered biological agents, some of which could be mutated viruses and selective bioterrorism, and the use of biological and chemi chemical warfare for selective genocide through genome and DNA, DNA editing. Th these are some of the things they're grappling with in the current problems of facing the world. And as part of that, they're really concerned about what they refer to as ecological collapse, which is whole ecology systems being wiped out by human greed, pollution and resource mismanagement. You know, they're also very concerned, this is the UN particularly, in their, in their global catastrophic risks with nuclear holocaust. You know, the Cold, the Cold War era saw a rise in the development of nuclear weapons, which was a race won by a few, which now seek to dominate the world through fear to stop others from developing such weapons of, of mass destruction. How to manage that? And one of the other big issues they're trying to grapple with is overpopulation. You know, see, as countries face the challenge of population explosion, the issues associated with the disparate distribution of the human race and its ability to feed itself is becoming a major issue for, for, issue for many countries who often themselves are being overrun with refugees from neighboring countries seeking to escape the impacts of war and famine and disease. And that's all things without even considering global pandemics, the likes of which you know, COVID-19 is one of these. But, but the issues with global pandemics is that they're increased, increasing in such a pace that, that they're deeply concerned about the impacts on the planet. You know, before COVID-19, the 14th century Black Plague, the 1918 Spanish flu, the HIV and AIDS pandemic, the smallpox virus, just to name a few, are now worried about an overprescription of antibiotics. You know, they're really concerned about antibiotic resistance microorganisms. And, and pandemics just continue to plague the world. The virus emergence of, of Ebola, the coronaviruses, just COVID-19 only being one of them. You know, H5N1 avian, uh, avian flu, the Zika virus. They're all there. They're all risks. And they don't know how to manage them. You see, it's interesting, isn't it? See, the world no longer confident that each nation's own government has the capability to deal with the issues caused by man's corporate greed. Well, what have they gone and done? We see man has gone and established a plethora of other governing and legislative authorities to try and combat the problems facing the world over and above their own separate governments. You know, just try and think about a couple of these. You know, He's, he's the United Nations, whose role is to preserve international peace and security. Or, or NATO, or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, whose mission is to protect the freedom of its members. Its targets include weapons of mass destruct, destruction, terrorism, and cyber attacks. Or, or when, one we haven't put on the, the screen, the World Bank. It's an international organization that offers developmental assistance to middle-income and low-income countries that might be struggling due to all of the things that we've just mentioned. The International Red Cross, um, the, the, the largest humanitarian network in the world. Its mission is to alleviate human suffering and protect life and health and uphold human dignity. 
especially during armed conflicts and other emergencies, or, or Greenpeace, and independent campaigning organisations, which uses very creative confrontations to expose global environmental problems and trying to develop solutions for green and peaceful future. And look, the list goes on and on and on of these, you know, global um, organisations that that um, cross government borders to try and alleviate the world's challenges. So here's the problem. The problem is one of governance. You know, no one country has the authority and the ability to subject others to global needs or global challenges. And thus, when we consider the world there's still wars being fought over territorial disputes. There's currently 45 documented wars being fought where people have and continue to lose their lives. 45 different wars. And the world's either powerless to do anything about it or they're choosing not to get involved or they're being prevented so for political or monetary means. So why the question that we pose in the 21st century of digital age in which we live, are we still suffering and continue to, to deal with and create more chaos and mayhem with world governments failing to manage any of these massive, great big global catastrophic risks? Why? Why is this a problem? The answer is that not one, not one entity, not one government, not one king, not one ruler has the power and the authority to universally govern, to set global laws, global rules, global regulations, and no one has the ability to bring everyone to justice, regardless of who they are or where they are or what they've done. No one entity has the mandate to govern like this. But you know what? That's soon to change. You see, God has a plan and always has, all the way along as we've seen through all of our other seminars, he has left the world as it appears to their own devices because he in the background has been establishing and setting up a platform for the emergence of his kingdom. And he's about to reset the world with the last part of his plan with the globe. And right from the very beginning, God had it mapped. You see, man in the Garden of Eden, the man and the woman or Adam and Eve, disobeyed the commandment of God by reaching out and eating a piece of fruit in disobedience to God's will. Why? Because they wanted their own glory. They wanted to seek equality with God. And ever since this time, mankind has endeavored to do the same and fallen further and further from God's ideals, filling the earth not with God's glory, but instead with violence and disease and corruption through his own devices and imaginations to fulfill his thirst for authority, for power, and for money through pride and greed and arrogance. It all began in the, in the Garden of Eden. And the world and man's governments believe, and, and primarily believe because if they didn't believe it, they wouldn't be elected or stay in power. They believe they do have the knowledge and the ability and the power to cure, them, cure themselves. And yet the evidence and the proof points to the complete opposite of that. The world and its inhabitants left to its own devices continues to seek for solutions to all of life's problems and many more, created mostly by their own doing through profiteering, often as a byproduct of previously implemented solutions, which whilst have cured some things, have created and destroyed many other things through their own side effects. Why? Why do they continue to fail? Well, they continue to fail because they fail to understand the central issue that lies to the center of all things. And that is the real question as to what we're supposed to be doing and why we were even here from the first place. You see, they fail to realize that there is in fact a creator who has designed us all from the very beginning with a master plan. And because people have not stopped to understand the plan, man fails in his strategy and execution to achieve all that God had designed. Do you know that's why all forms of man-made governance has failed and why the world continues to develop new problems as it seeks to fix its current ones. You see, man-made governance was not requested from the beginning. 
God back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, put man in a garden to dress it and to keep it. And what he meant by that was to look after it and to guard it. And I want you to note in Genesis chapter 2 that it was a garden that never belonged to him, never belonged to man but from which man was permitted to eat and to feed from all the fruits that the garden offered to him. Blessings afforded to him and blessings he took for granted and subsequently was sent from the garden as a consequence of his actions. You see, God outlined man's purpose right from the very beginning in Genesis chapter one. And man's purpose was to multiply and to replenish the earth and to subdue the earth and to have dominion, particularly over the animal kingdom. And you know what? That's exactly the way the Bible talks about it's going to be in the future. You see, man was designed to become gardeners, not warriors. To become guardians, not antagonists. To be farmers, not soldiers. To have control over the animal world. And remember, it's a garden in which every tree, according to Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, was pleasant to the sight and good for food. You see, this is how it was designed from the very beginning and how it will be in the future. We're going to come back to this garden. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more later on. You see, the world and all of its various forms of governance has only created chaos, inequity, and war because they've failed to realize the plan and the requirements that God wanted right from the very beginning. It was his world. It was his garden. They were his trees. It all was his resources. Man was only ever permitted to manage them, to bring the world to a point where they would turn to accept him because he alone has the answers to the issues of the globe and the mandate to govern his world. So how is God going to fix all of these problems? What is going to happen? How is it going to work? Well, you will recall the words of Daniel chapter 2. And I want tonight to try and bring together all the thoughts that we've explored over our seminars in all of our various prophecies to try and bring this all together to show how it all works. You see, you'll recall the words of Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, which Speaking after Daniel has explained the dream to Nebuchadnezzar he saw, and in providing Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, with the interpretation of his dream, he says that in the days of these kings, the kings of Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and divided Europe, in the days of these kings, he says, the God of heaven will be setting up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all of these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And you see, what Daniel was telling Nebuchadnezzar was that God was already at work. He was already establishing a kingdom to take over all the kingdoms at some point in the future. And all of their various forms of incompetent governance would be destroyed because why God had set a day when his kingdom will come and that he will destroy all other forms of governance, and that his kingdom will be established on the earth, and it will be set up and stand forever. And you will remember, in consideration of the prophecies of Armageddon, that, that this is the day that is spoken of in Revelation chapter 16, verse 16, when God will gather together all the kingdoms of the world, and he's going to gather them together into the battle of the great day of God Almighty. It's God's battle. God's in control. And it's, and it's going to come in that day that God will set about to bring to pass the kingdom he has been working on all throughout this time and establish it on the earth. And you will recall like, the commonly echoed but not well understood words of the Lord's Prayer of Matthew chapter 6, when he says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ himself taught his disciples to pray for a time when a kingdom would come and be established on the earth. And so when the Bible refers to a kingdom, it's not some fairy land on clouds, 
but a time when a king will rule as a monarch on the earth and over all the earth, having universal authority and supreme control over all the world. So politically, how will this work? How is it going to actually be achieved? Well, we know that the form of governance that God has chosen to use is a monarchy. And when we consider the governance structure that God's appointed, he's chosen a monarchy for a very specific reason. It's a form of government that has a monarch at the head and one where often a king is surrounded by a royal family. And we'll come back to that royal family shortly but that the kingdom is administered by key ruling servants who do his bidding on behalf of the king. And you will know that all kings have a location from which they rule. They have a dominion over, over which they rule and the subjects over whom they rule too. And the Bible speaks of a time when the Lord Jesus Christ will come back as God's appointed king to rule in Jerusalem in the land of Israel over all the world. And I want you to consider the following passages, some of which we know well, particularly the one of the Lord Jesus Christ speaking at his birth when the angels proclaimed to Mary in Luke chapter one that Jesus has a very had a very special destiny to fulfill at his birth, Luke chapter one and verse 32, when he says, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall rule over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. And some of the themes you will see from previous um, from Daniel chapter two, where he's going to set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Here's another kingdom which shall have no end. But I want you to notice a couple of things in Luke chapter one, verse 32. It says he will sit on a throne as a king. And it will be the throne of, notice it says, his father David. And, and his, his father from many, many generations before, through the line um, of, through the lineage of Jesus, was, was a man by David who ruled the kingdom of Israel and, his, and over the house of Jacob, which was obviously the Jews, from Jerusalem. So the Lord Jesus Christ had a destiny to fulfill as a king established over all of the house of Israel with a kingdom that will be established over all uh, of which there will be no end to that kingdom. But I want you to notice it will be more than just a rulership over the nation of Israel because it says in Revelation chapter 11 verse 15, speaking of a time when all things have been accomplished, and it's proclaimed that the kingdoms, Revelation 11, uh, verse 15, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And so as with the stone power that destroyed in Daniel chapter 2, all of the kingdoms, all of those kings, it filled, that stone grew and filled the whole earth. Well, see, here's the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, where the king will be established, he will take control, he'll have sovereign control over the whole world and of his kingdom, there will be no end. He will reign forever and ever. And we could turn a multitude number of passages to prove the same point, but they all reinforce the same issues, that the Lord Jesus Christ will be a king living in Jerusalem, ruling over the world, and will bring the world subject to him. You see, the big question we have to ask ourselves is, well, why will this monarchy be any different from previously failed forms of governance that were also established as monarchies? That would be the question, isn't it? If, if the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be established as a king over the world, how is that going to be any different to any other king that's tried to set themselves up over territories? Well, the answer to that is this, that this ruler will be different and it will be a different, the type the world has never seen before. I want you to think of, of 
the words of the apostle of the great apostle Paul as he preached to a gathered audience in Athens in Acts chapter 17, verse 31. He's warning them of a time in the future when judgment will occur. But he says this, he says, because God hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he raised him from the dead. This is obviously speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to notice that God has set a day when his resurrected son, the Lord Jesus Christ, will return and judge the world. But note, it will be done in righteousness. You know, the world has never seen a ruler that has never been corrupted by power, that has never been affected by greed, has never been influenced by politics, and that has never sinned. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ will be different from every other ruler because he will instigate a new policy reform of righteousness. And by this principle and by this policy, he will, notice what Paul says, he will judge the world. You see, what is righteousness? How will this system work? Well, well, righteousness, in, in, in its broadest sense, refers to the character and condition of mankind when man ought to be acceptable before God. And what that character specifies really is that this person or these people will only do what is right. They're not going to do what's wrong. They're not going to do what they feel. They're going to do what's right according to God's ways. And, and you see, it's someone, therefore, that, that acts with integrity with virtue, with purity of life, doing what is right, honest in thinking and feeling and in actions, all in accordance with God's will and God's ways. You see, and by this principle, the world will be judged. You see, Christ as the king will be the arbitrator of God's righteousness in the earth as he is God's son. He's been resurrected because he did no sin. He's been made immortal and he's been delegated, therefore, with the authority and the responsibility of ruling the earth on God's behalf. And so whilst reigning as a monarch and as a king, he only does so as God's representative and on God's authority. And so it will be through this process, the establishment of righteous rulership, that God's purpose can then be finally outworked in the earth. And so what will change? What's going to happen? Well, the world will change as we know it. You know, the Bible speaks of a time when after the kingdoms of this world have been consumed and brought to their, their knees, a period of rebuilding will occur. This is, as we saw, will be a time when God's own people, the Jews, will be integral to the time of rebuilding the world. The so Lord Jesus Christ will rule from Jerusalem with a city and a kingdom established in that place with the Jews as his key servants in that space. So what will change? Well, politically, there will be one ruling authority in the earth. You see, the Bible refers to this time in Psalm 72, verse 11, when all kings will fall down before him and all nations will serve him. You see, there will at this time in the future be one common global agenda. There'll be one justice system, one authority, one king that all will be subject to and that all will need to obey. You see, he will have universal control and will bring about sweeping reforms and changes. And the Bible speaks of this time when a number of things will change. You see, the first thing that will change will be that peace will be established and that war will be abolished and outlawed. You see, Isaiah chapter 2, and I encourage anyone to, that, that looks through these passages to look at them in the light of the kingdom because that's what they're speaking of. The kingdom of the future, it says in Isaiah chapter 2 verse 4, that nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. 
You see, war will be abolished and it will be outlawed. You see, there will be no frictions amongst neighbours as to their land disputes and whose rightful possession of the land it actually is. Because, well, all will know, according to Psalm 24, verse 1, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the world and they that dwell therein. You see, the world is God's, always has been, always will be. And the fullness of it and the people within it are all God's. There will be no more friction over land disputes and whose rightful possession of territories because God will be in control through his king. You see, no further, no, no longer will there be battles fought over religion because there will only be one religion and one law and one rule. You see, Isaiah 2, before um, the comment about war, says that it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house will be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations will flow in unto it, and many people shall go and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of Yahweh, or the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So peace will be established, war will be abolished, no battles over land, no battles over religion, because peace will be instilled as an overriding principle of Christ's policy in his kingdom. You know, more than that, the Bible says there's a couple of other big things that the Lord Jesus Christ will do. And they are all things that every government seeks to try and achieve. It's fascinating. You see, equity will be provided for all. You see, there will no longer be issues associated with rich and poor, no broken health systems, no unfair tax systems geared to those who can hide their wealth or can bury it in other places. It will be, rule, it will be a rule established on the principle of righteousness where distribution of resources will be fair and equitable. You see, this of Psalm 72, verse 2 and verse 4, he says, He, the King, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy and shall break in pieces the oppressor. You see, equity, equity will be provided for all. It will be a fair system. That's why people will want to be part of this system. That's why people will understand that he's a righteous ruler, because it will be fair. You see, and more than that, you see, health and well-being will be restored. You see, instead of a corrupt system run by global pharmaceutical companies that drive, driven by corporate greed and profiteering, trying to protect their IP and patents, Global health will be resurrected and provided to all. You see, Psalm 72 says, verses 12 and 13, for he, that's the king, shall deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. He shall spear the poor and the needy and shall save the souls of the needy. And a key central part of this policy that the Lord Jesus Christ will unveil will be the fact that nutrition and food will be available for all under his control. There will be no issues associated with famine or pestilence or war or disease because the Lord Jesus Christ will have authority. He will have control and he will be able to produce food. You see, Psalm 72 verse 16, speaking of that time, says that there will be a handful of corn on the earth upon the top of a mountain where there's normally snow and it's so hard to grow something. On the top of that mountain will be corn, handfuls of it. And the fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, which had massive great big wooden wood, forests of big wood. And that what there's alluding to at this time is a time where the hills will, will rustle in the wind with the thunder of corn top of the mountains, and they of the city shall flourish like the grass of the earth. See, Isaiah chapter 35, verses 5 and 6 says that of that time, talking about those that were sick 
and those that might have problems. He says, the eyes of the blind, well, they're going to be opened. You see, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame man who couldn't walk, well, he's going to leap his heart and the tongue of the dumb, the dumb who can't speak will sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. You see, this king will have control over the world. So, and finally, when, it talk, when we talk about health and well-being, you see the reason for why that will occur is in Isaiah chapter 2, we didn't have room to put this on the, on the screen, but in Isaiah chapter 2, he says that the instruments of war that would normally be used for fighting will be turned to agricultural use. They'll be turned into agricultural in instruments to maximize productivity. He shall judge, says Isaiah 2 verse 4, among the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. You see, under the Lord Jesus Christ as the king, there will be no need to reconsider or consider the current concerns of global catastrophic risk. All of them will be dealt with. No issues of climate change, no issues of AI taking over the planet, no risk of biotechnical or biological warfare, no ecological collapse, no nuclear concerns, no issues with food distribution or overpopulation. He will solve all of these things and many, many more that man has failed to ever be able to address or to find solutions for. You think about the Lord Jesus Christ putting forward his platform for rationale for taking power on the throne. There will be no need for election. His policy platform won't just solve one nation's problems. You see, he will solve all of the world's problems with his father's power and his father's support. Why? Well, because that's God, that was God's purpose all along. You see, God, remember, in Acts chapter 17 said that he had appointed a day in which he would judge the world in righteousness by the man he had ordained. You see, he had it in his plan all along. God has always been in control. But for tonight, I want you to understand that whilst the Bible speaks of a time in the near future when the Lord Jesus Christ will be a king ruling in Jerusalem, the Bible is at pains to teach and tell us that he won't be ruling alone. I want to come back now to the concept of the royal family that I referred to in the monarchy. You see, in fact, we've got so much support from many other passengers. He will have, sorry, so much more support from others whom he will appoint as fellow heirs and fellow kings to rule alongside him, to help him, to bring his policy platform to life. You see, I want you to think about these passages that the Lord Jesus Christ himself talked about. You see, he will not rule alone. Look what he said, talking to the disciples in Luke chapter 22, verses 29 to 30. He says, and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father hath appointed unto me. I'm going to give it to you that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on the thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. You see, there are going to be others that sit on thrones judging others. You see, in the Revelation chapter 2, the class of people that the Lord Jesus Christ says to those that overcome, those that keep his works unto the end, to him, he says, will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of potter shall be broken to shivers. Even as I received of my father to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. And it's these people that will sing this new song when the Lord Jesus Christ has established the kingdom. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10, verse 10, they'll say, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests 
and we shall reign on the earth. There are going to be a group of people who are going to be made unto their God kings and priests and will rule on the earth with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now we begin to see how God's purpose will be accomplished and will be established. You see, he will not just demand authority by one mandated despotic ruler, but will bring his purpose to pass through the establishment of righteous governance with those working in conjunction with people who have responded to God's will and who they themselves have prepared to rule alongside his son when he returns. And so this begs the question posed by tonight's seminar, how do we prepare for Jesus' return? You see, if our role is to become kings and priests, there are various attributes and characteristics that were required of kings and priests that they might rule. You know, it's quite interesting because the Bible speaks about the requirements for kings and the requirements for priests. You see, the role of a king was to judge. And God told Moses 500 years before there was even a king established in Israel to write down these requirements to follow in Deuteronomy chapter 17, when he says, it shall be when he, the king, sits on the throne of his kingdom, that the first thing he was to do was to write a copy of this law in a book of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read there in all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and the statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the left, to the right hand or to the left to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom and his children in the midst of Israel. You see, the king was required to write a copy of the whole law, to read it every day, to study it, to meditate on it, to understand what God wanted him so that he might rule and judge with justice and with judgment so that he might not be pride, proud or arrogant or lifted up, but that he might rule in the way that God intended him. You see, he was to learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of his law and his statutes, to remain humble and to understand what God's purpose was so that he might rule the people who God had provided him, that he might develop God's will and God's purpose in himself and in others, and to wisely, therefore, discern between what was right and wrong in all matters of judgment and to show good, positive example to others. It required him to go back to the law to the word, to understand what should happen in matters of everyday life when working with others to make decisions on all matters of life in accordance with God's will. You see, the Bible was to become a manual that was to be used for his life. So the question posed by that then, is this that how we're using the Bible today? Do we understand what is commanded of us in the scriptures? Are we ready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and for our role as a king? You see, the Proverbs alluding to the inquiring mind of the king and the word of God said that the key requirement of the king was to search out the matters of God. It was a requirement of the king. It was the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings to search out a matter, says Proverbs 25 verse 2. It was a requirement of the king to understand the purpose of God to be able to understand and answer all of life's conundrums, because the answers to that were always contained in the pages of the Bible. And they just require diligence and humble searching to ensure that they're understood on what the Bible has asked of each and every one of us to prepare for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps this is the key we need to learn in respect to preparing for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, to read and to understand the Bible and what God has commanded of us. To read and understand who God is, what he wants from us in response to his will. And when we understand what is contained in his word, we'll find that God's purpose is not opaque. It is not hard to understand, but it requires the changes of each and every one of us to read carefully, to inquire what the meaning of our life is now, so that we can become ready for our role in the future. Do we know our Bible well enough? Have we fully understood what God's purpose is? 
Well, if we're not clear, it's a great place to start. So that's the role and the purpose of a king. What about the priest? Well, similarly, the priest's role is quite specified too in the Bible. You see, the priest's role was amongst the people. It was an education role. You see, Leviticus 10 says that the role of the priest was to teach the children of Israel all the statutes which Yahweh had sp- the Lord had spoken but unto them by the hand of Moses. That was their role was to teach, to educate, so that they might put a difference between what was holy and unholy and clean and unclean, and they could teach the children of Israel. Malachi chapter 2 verse 7 says that the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they, the people, should seek the law at his mouth because he was the messenger of the Lord of hosts. You see, the priests were God's representatives, separate and holy from the rest of his people, dedicated to serve and to share the law of, of God for his people, to educate them, to help them understand, to care for them, and to make sacrifices for them in the temple. They were there to work with the people in service to them. And as with the king, it required them to be fully understanding of all the laws and the commandments and the purpose of God, that they might share it with the people with whom they worked. And so not only if we are to prepare for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and to participate as part of his kingdom, not only do we have to become kings and understanding the word that we might judge with judge with, with righteous judgment, but that we might be able to share and educate others in all that God has commanded us. You see, for us, we have to understand. We have to change the way we live so that we might share the message and live those with, as, as an uh, example to others. And so the Bible tells us that we must first study to understand. We must then be, be baptized in order to, to, be repent, to show our repentance and to receive forgiveness by God himself and to walk then in newness of life and witness of this truth to others. You see, The Bible talks about the Lord Jesus Christ as both a king and a priest, that he would rule his people with righteousness and that he would teach the world about the purpose and the will of God as God's representative to help to save them. There can be therefore no denying that if we are commanded to follow the Lord Jesus Christ to do his commandments, we must first come back to the words of this book and understand God's will and God's purpose. Because when we do this with an open and honest heart, we find that we will come to an understanding of the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. The only way we can do this is through a study and meditation of the scriptures. And when this is done, we find that God requires of us to be baptized into the saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might also be co-heirs and co-rulers with him when he returns you see but our preparation obviously doesn't end there does it understanding knowledge and faith must become applied and practical so that it changes the way we act and how we work with others you see the bible talks about the need to live a new life dedicated to god appreciating the work the lord jesus christ has achieved but then speaking openly of this knowledge that others might come to an understanding and purpose of god It first starts with a diligence and inquiring mind to understand the will and purpose of God. And so we've got to get back to the Bible. You see, many churches have turned away the words of the Bible and found truths that are right for them. I encourage you to open your Bible, to search them diligently, as many churches don't promote the reading and understanding of God's word. You see, as Christophians, this is who we are a group of Bible students who study the word to understand the meaning of life and God's purpose with the earth and with us. We'd love to help and assist in anyone seeking to understand God's purpose and what the Bible says, as we believe it's simple and easy to understand. It doesn't require a theology degree to interpret its message because God has asked each and every one of us to be kings and priests. And all we need to do is to start by reading with an open mind and an honest heart. And more importantly, we don't have long. Because as we've seen throughout all of the seminars, that Christ's return is imminent. You see, Christ at the very end 
of the book of Revelation, his last words and message to us is that we're living in the time of the end. His return is imminent. And he says in Revelation chapter 22, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. And John says, in response to that, the Apostle John, who saw all of those events in Revelation, he says, blessed are they that do his, that's Christ's commandments, that they might have right to a tree of life and may enter in through the gates of that city, speaking of the kingdom to come. And so you will remember, right from the very beginning, God placed man in a garden to dress it, and to keep it. And one day in the very near future, the garden will be restored. And instead of being banished from it for eating fruit he was forbidden to eat, all of a sudden, he will be permitted to eat of the fruits of that tree of life. See, once this whole world has understood the will and the purpose of God as taught by his son, and us as his co-ruling kings and priests, all the world will once again be commanded to protect and to keep his guard. The question for us, and the one we pose as we finish, is will you choose to take up your role and responsibility and prepare to work alongside the Lord Jesus Christ as a king and a priest, to work in the Lord's kingdom and in his garden? If so, you need to act. You need to begin to prepare now. Because as we've shown all the way through our seminar series, we believe because God is in control that Jesus' return is not far away at all.